yeah, I'm just looking at it now. So will that go live on the actual channel in YouTube at some point? If you refresh the channel. Okay. Oh yes, there we are. Yeah. It should be there now. Yeah, it's there. So I just click on it, I take it. Yeah. Perfect. And hopefully you can see our the four faces. Yay! Lovely. <laughs> So I'm going to leave that to you if that's okay, DC. So the people on YouTube, they, they are not able to, uh, to, to communicate with us, right? No, um, they, can, they can use the comments field to ask questions that way. Right, so, so there will be comments from YouTube and comments on Zoom. And so you put both, into Teams. And you we'll put both, them all into Teams. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> You just watch Teams, Marty. It'll be all work beautifully. I'll be watching Leslie. <laughs> watching and listening to Leslie. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, I hope it's worth it. I am sure. I have no doubt at all. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, it's been very useful doing these talks because it helps me marshal all our the logic for re reporting and things as well. So it's been helpful for IAC uh, inadvertently. So I've just been reminded by someone that we're already on YouTube, on live, so we should, okay. we should kind of uh, make sure that we don't say anything inflammatory. Uh, <laughs> so we're already you... live. I... Is everyone happy for me to start letting people in? Yeah, I'm going to mute myself now. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll uh, we'll leave it a few more minutes for for uh, to for people to uh, to join. I think we have quite a lot of people joining us, so it takes may take a little bit of time before we uh, we uh, uh, we all kind of there. Um, so I'll uh, I'll leave it for one more minute or so, and then we'll uh, we'll start. If that's okay with you, Les. So we're still letting people in, so we'll, uh, we'll wait for uh, one or two more minutes before we start.
Okay, I think I'll, I will start with uh, with uh, the kind of introductions uh, to uh, to this uh, the lane lecture of 2021, um, and it's uh, an absolute pleasure and honor uh, to uh, to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Leslie Rushton uh, this uh, this afternoon, who will talk about um, long COVID and uh, whether this should be you know. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry, was, <laughs> somebody muted me. <laughs> I don't know whether that was intentional or, or not, but uh, um, so, um, yeah, so my name is, uh, my name is Marty Van Tongren, for those who, who, who don't uh, know me. Uh, I'm uh, kind of professor in occupational environmental health at the University of Manchester. Uh, where I, I uh, kind of lead the, uh, the Center for uh, Occupational and Environmental Health. Um, we're part of uh, the School of Health Sciences, but we're also very much collaborating with the, uh, the, uh, the, within the Thomas Ashton Institute, um, which is uh, a kind of an institute that, that looks at uh, um, uh, kind of risk and regulations in, the, in, in particularly in the workspace. So, um, this afternoon, we have, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Dr. Leslie Rushton, who uh, will talk uh, about long COVID uh, and um, and the whether that should be a uh, an, an an occupational disease. Um, the um, before I hand over to Leslie, uh, there's a few kind of housekeeping. Um, things that I want to share with you. Um, first of all, this uh, lecture is, is being recorded uh, and, you are, and there are also people watching it live on YouTube um, and the recording will be, uh, will be made available uh, afterwards on, on the kind of uh, websites, both of the COEH and the Thomas Ashton. Um, I like to request that everyone make sure that they uh, mute themselves and, uh, and ideally also have their video turned off for the duration of the presentation. Um, um, please ask uh, questions um, using the chat function um, in Zoom. And if you're on YouTube, I think you can put comments in on the, or questions in on the comment uh, uh, function and, uh, the, those comments on YouTube will also be uh, uh, directed uh, to me uh, through the, the 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 kind of means of a Teams kind of like channel that we also have open. So uh, please use chat function and the comment function. Um, you can also kind of if there's any kind of other issues, you can email uh, uh, the the uh, us at Ashton at Manchester.ac.uk. Um, so the program. For uh, this afternoon, um, we have approximately until until half past five. Um, we uh, will soon start with the uh, with the with the lane lecture, um, and then we will have a, a a period for for question and answers. Like I said, I will be uh, relaying the questions to Leslie at the end of the uh, at, at the end of the lecture. Um, um, a little bit of information, background information for the for those of you who don't know uh, the the background, the history of uh, of of the Lane Lecture. So Professor Lane uh, started um, at the University of Manchester in 1945 uh, and was a, 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 a kind of a professor here until. Uh, 1964, in fact, the year that I was born. Um, so he kind of established a very uh, 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 strong department uh, at the University of Manchester in occupational health that has uh, continued till the present day. Um, so he believed essentially in, in clinical nature, and Ronald believed very strong in the essential uh, clinical nature of occupational medicine and saw patients throughout his career. And, uh, and that I think is an, a very important aspect of, uh, of occupational medicine. Um, so this is an annual event uh, and held in honor of this, uh, of this remarkable man. Um, as I kind of mentioned uh, also previously, uh, we are a part of the, uh, the Institute of, uh, the Thomas Ashton Institute for Risk and Regulatory Research. Um, and that's a, a joint, uh, kind of uh, 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 institute across 
the three kind of faculties at the uh, University of Manchester. So it's an interdisciplinary uh, kind of institute, but it also kind of involves uh, the, the health and safety executive. And so it, it combines uh, and, and aims to kind of deliver research, learning and regulatory insights uh, to enable a better working world. Um, you can find out a little bit more about, about the, the Thomas Ashton in, uh, in, uh, on the website just to kind of say that we work across a number of themes and that uh, those themes are kind of displayed in that, in that figure on the right. Yeah. However, um, I would like to kind of like introduce, uh, make uh, introduce now uh, Leslie uh, to the uh, to do to give the uh, to to give the lecture. I've known Leslie for a kind of a number of years now, and uh, and and worked with her kind of on on a number of projects, including the kind of uh, the the cancer bird, the, the GB cancer burden project, uh, which which was I think tremendously influential in the, in the UK and elsewhere, and then. We continued that collaboration in a number of other kind of projects that looked at the 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 uh, the kind of impact of uh, of occupational exposures on uh, on disease and and clearly we currently live in a situation where um, uh, there are uh, uh, important risks uh, from uh, working in certain environments to getting infected by the uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, virus and also kind of may potentially have longer term impact of those uh, infections because of the the, the 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 jobs that people are doing. So I'm tremendously looking forward, to, uh, Leslie, to your to your lecture. And uh, over to you. Thank you. So I hope you can um, see the slides all right. Oh, you're nodding, that's great. Thank you very much for a very kind um, invitation and welcome, Marty, and all the organisers. It's a, a great honour to um, be doing this um, lecture. And I know that many um, people in the occupational health world have done one before. So I um, really appreciate being asked to, um, to, to give this. Um, I first need to say, though, that I, I work, well, I, I'm actually emeritus at Imperial College London, but I also chair the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council. And I will be um, mentioning that in, in the context of, of COVID, but I just uh, want to say that I'll be speaking as an independent researcher rather than as the chair of this um, committee. So um, just a brief word on the outline of this. I'm just going to go back and set the scene as to remind us all about the peaks and troughs and lockdowns we've all been through. Um, I think it's quite important to, to do this because um, there's been such a lot of um, information and papers and reports coming out uh, rapidly over the last 18 months. I think it's the, the fastest moving research area um, that I've ever, ever been um, in, involved in. And, and interpreting all the data partly um, needs knowledge of what was actually going on at the time when the study was taken place. I'm going to um, talk about uh, who, who actually did work during the pandemic and how they work, um, the symptoms and outcomes and what happened if people um, were infected, what were the risks and what it, occupations were at risk. Then go on to talk about some of the health effects, the acute complications and longer term, and then think about um, what we're going to do about it in terms of occupation and occupational disease. So just to remind us what we, we're talking about here, we're talking about a virus, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, um, first identified officially in China but, um, uh, and in the UK on the 31st of January at the first case of COVID and that the, the virus causes the disease, which has been named COVID-19. Um, uh, and there are various uh, definitions of 
what the um, disease, the manifestations, if you like, of the disease. The one that I've got up on the screen at the moment is from NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence. And it goes from acute COVID, uh, defined in terms of the first four weeks, to what is they, they deem as long COVID, which is signs and symptoms persisting after that time, with ongoing being four to 12 weeks, and this syndrome, post-COVID-19 syndrome, which we tend to think of as uh, the short-term long COVID, defined as longer than 12 weeks. Now, um, not only have we been getting lots of information constantly, every time you open your computer in the morning or look at your phone, there's another study come through, but the definitions and the knowledge of the actual disease um, and the virus itself um, have, um, ha have really developed rapidly. So in, this is the NICE definition, but in fact, in October 2020, the WHO issued this de definition. Um, so it's a, a condition which occurs in individuals with a history of probable or confirmed SARS-CoV-2. And that's, a, that's an interesting definition because one of the major issues is, ha have you actually had a confirmed um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 test. Um, it, it's, uh, the definition is, it, it says the onset must be um, within, the condition must occur within three months so that you can't explain it by an alternative diagnosis. And that's because other viruses have similar um, uh, symptoms. Um, that the symptoms generally have an impact on everyday functioning. So that's moving a little bit further away and saying it has to, you have to, you know, we have to, you have to lose loss, uh, loss of faculty, maybe have some um, disability. But another interesting aspect of their definition is that it may be new onset following initial recovery, or it might be a, a lapse or persist from the initial illness. So they are making that definition is a lot more flexible. So just to remind you what happened over the pandemic, this is England, and this is a graph of the deaths. So here's our first peak. Big one, though, bigger one in um, uh, over the uh, autumn last year into um, March. And here we are today, sort of pretty well going up and down between about six or seven hundred to a thousand per week which if, you, if that carries on for a year is an awful lot of deaths. So we're not out of the woods yet. The testing data partly um, reflects the testing regimes in place. And if you remember, it does seem a long time ago, doesn't it? Um, if you go back to the early wave, um, there wasn't much testing done except for um, healthcare workers here, whereas now we're, we're more likely to, to be able to get a test. Whether or not it gives you the right answer though is, 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 a de is debatable. The other thing that makes interpretation of, of our data is the complexity of the restriction, restriction measures that were in place. So this is from um, a, a, a book produced, it's available online, um, from it, for the House of Commons. Um, this is the lo lockdown laws over time, going through to, to um, May last year, this May this year, sorry. So this is when we started our lockdown really, and we've got nobody meeting, all stay at home, no hospitality open. Then it, we get a little bit opening here. Um, it's the summer, we have a short period where everything's okay, but come September, we get restrictions on who we can meet. Um, we start these tiers. Does everybody remember the tiers? Very complex. Um, and uh, then we, we start a mini lockdown here where we're not allowed to meet people. We have to stay at home. Hospitality is closed. Then we introduce more tiers and um, we don't start um, uh, getting out of another lockdown until March this year and finally out in Ju on July the 17th. So very complex, 
and, and the, not only are these national um, lockdowns and so on, but we also had with the, the tiers, local ones. So if you have a study in say somebody in say from a hospital in Leicester, Leicester had restrictions most of the time. So you would have to take into account um, just not just the national what picture, but the, the local picture. <clears throat> this is just a figure illustrating how home environments, environmental conditions and workplaces together impact on the risk of trans transmission for an individual and potential forward transmission. So here's our virus and here's our disease. And we're interested primarily in the occupational exposures that people might have occurred. But obviously we have non-occupational ones, household, social environments, transport, and these work both ways. Household transmission may um, feed into occupational um, infection and vice versa. So first of all, I'm just going to um, talk a little bit about the um, work who actually did some work. The, um, this comes from the ONS and the labor force surveys. And uh, it gave quite a lot of information about who were the sort of workers that might um, be uh, out to work and not working from home and so on um, in 2020. And in, in fact, about a third of the total workforce um, were what was deemed then key worker um, occupations, industries, essential workers. The largest group was in health and social care. And um, the Labour First Force survey gave some insight into some of the characteristics of these key workers. 15% had some form of uh, health condition, which might make them at a um, maybe a, a moderate risk from COVID. Um, the, uh, a lot of the key workers had children, um, about a third between five and 15 years. Uh, some uh, 15 or 16 had them under five. Uh, several house uh, key workers worked with and lived with another one. And a lot, traveled to work by public transport. So a lot was going on whilst quite a number of us were working at home. So I said about a third were social health and social care. That's um, up to three, three million, two million in education and childcare. Um, a lot in food, transport, key public services and so on. So these are all the areas which were deemed to be essential. There's, they're not the same for males and females. Nine, about 80% of the health and social care and education and childcare um, key workers were women. About 90% were transport, so um, uneven across um, the sexes. Uh, the health risks, quite a lot had potential um, problems which might have made them more vulnerable for um, uh, COVID and and uh, and the um, the problems re resulting from COVID. So heart problems, respiratory problems, diabetes. Diabetes is an interesting one because uh, the um, there's an estimate of about sixty thousand undiagnosed diabetes cases last year. Um, because we weren't doing routine blood and urine tests. There's also um, a study, um, ONS does a, a, a looks at uh, where people work each year. And this is for 2020, so the whole of last year. And they asked people, where, do you work at home? And this is the industry sectors. And this color, this blue, is uh, the proportion of people who never work at home. And they're in the, the sort of industries that you would expect, accommodation, transport, repair, health and social work and so on, and construction and so on. But a number of people in these industry sectors did were able to work at home. And this is in this dark color here. Um, these are people who recently in 2020 were able to work at home. So, not all of these 
are, are people who are, are they're key worker. They're, they are key workers, but they're not working outside the home, which is another thing that one has to bear in mind. So who, what, what, who actually developed COVID-19? Um, what were their characteristics? And what were their occupations? Let's have just a think about the transmission. When at the beginning of the first of the beginning of the pandemic, March, April, May to July to the summer, we were very much concerned about contact with contaminated objects, direct physical contact between individuals. And there were big campaigns to sanitize everything, which sanitize ourselves wherever we went to shops and so on. Um, but it took a while for it to, um, for it, the realization that actually transmission through droplet spray and through fine aerosols um, were, was one of, were two of the major um, methods of pathways of trans transmission. Um, the, the no, knowing this um, uh, impacted on in restrictions in terms of distancing, social distancing. Um, obviously, it depends if the risks depend on individual behaviour, compliance, use of masks, and so on. And in the workplace, as in as in other places, the risks increase in with the proximity you are to your workers or your social contacts, if it's in a social um, environment, the number of contacts, the density, and the lack of controls. So knowing that sort of thing, what do we know about COVID and um, workers? Well, I'm going to show a, a, a range of data um, and I'm starting first with um, the reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous regulations um, uh, data, uh, which is collected by the Health and Safety Executive. And the Health and Safety Executive um, issued guidance quite quickly about um, uh, reporting uh, cases of, of infection and of SARS-CoV-2 and, and COVID um, through this, this um, reporting system. Uh, and the, the reporting is, you're supposed to do it, an employer is supposed to do it, if the, um, it's, it's more likely than not that the person were with the source of exposure. In this context, um, they were concerned about uh, exposure in terms of the of other workers being in, um, the infection being another worker, rather than work with the general public, um, and uh, that latter one was not considered to be a necessary um, reason for reporting. Um, this is the latest up to um, uh, August 2021. In fact, um, there's a new report coming out, uh, technical reports available on the Health and Safety Executive website, coming out on December the 6th. But I think the point is that it partly depends on who, who reports, um, uh, whether the employee themselves agree to this, and um, the, the industry. But we can see that there have been a huge number of these reports. It's very important informative to see this. Um, there, there are a lot under health and social work activities, but there was, I know, a campaign early on in the hospitals for um, health ca care um, staff um, to report um, COVID. And you can see that there are also quite a lot of fatal notifications as well. The other uh, um, Another useful area of, of identification of these workplace settings is through the reporting, another reporting system, which is, is on um, outbreaks of infection, which are often reported either to HSE, and I know HSE have um, 
investigated hundreds of these reports um, uh, uh, that have been uh, that they've been notified about. And so it's Public Health England, the HSE and local authorities very much involved in um, co collecting and reporting data. But again, we're getting the same sort of this is up to um, October this year um, that we're getting a, um, a number of workplace settings that are the sort of thing we'd expect from the RIDOR there out there where um, people, people have close contact with the public and their workplaces um, and our, our key workers. Um, there, there was a, a freedom of information request um, to update this. And you can see that the number of outbreaks has um, hugely increased. And um, I'm having a discussion with the HSC who, who are co coordinating analysis of the new data later on, and hopefully there'll be a, an update re report. So that will be extremely useful. As far as infection data is concerned, there are absolutely hundreds of studies. It's really difficult to make sense of them all. When, it, when the pandemic first started, because testing was done within the healthcare setting, there were a lot of opportunistic healthcare studies um, done in hospitals and other healthcare um, settings. And um, it's really quite tricky to, to interpret these because some of them are very small. It's very unclear about participation rates. There isn't a control population and no control for confounders. There are a lot more studies now though in the community, and I've just mentioned a few of these, which um, do repeat um, positivity testing. Some, um, some of them do like React um, or are following up a cohort, the Virus Watch and ONS also do regular, regular studies. So um, the, these are actually extremely um, useful and, and you can make a little bit more sense of them. Now, I started by showing the waves and mentioning the lot lockdowns. Um, and not surprisingly, the infection rates reflect what was going on. So this is um, an, an ONS um, set of data. These are their infection data. This is in healthcare workers, those not, faced, not dealing with patients directly and others in the job, a patient facing job role. And this is from September last year to May this year. And you can see how it's going up and down. This was where we had the huge peak of deaths. So not surprisingly, the infection rates are showing an, an increase. Um, and this is the sort of thing one, one needs to do. We need time series analyses really, um, to, because uh, what was going on in the general population is reflected in the occupational data. There is some data that gives us a, um, a bit of indication of what was going on with um, some of the other occupations. There's an awful lot on healthcare. Um, and this is from Virus Watch, which is a, a cohort study and shows um, the odds ratios um, compared with other professional and associated um, sectors here. Um, and you can see that we're, we've got the healthcare, but you're getting quite a lot of other um, retail here, social care, um, leisure and personal services, hairdressers and that sort of thing, um, gyms and so on. Um, and uh, the other study that's producing a lot of interesting information is REACT, the real-time assessment of community transmission. And they've been taking um, throat and nose swabs um, from representative cross-sectional samples um, roughly every month, but you can see the dates here. These are just some of the rounds, they call them rounds. And this is again showing the um, risk estimates um, for um, different work types um, compared for people not doing this. So this is delivering to homes and not delivering to homes. So I've put at the top here what was going on at the time. So in September, the infections were going up, but um, 
local tiers were still in place. Um, uh, by the October, the infection rates were zooming up and this is where the lockdowns came in. It came in on November the 5th, actually. Um, and mobility increased here and then the infection rates were starting to go down. So you can see how these differ over, um, over the uh, various waves and the various lockdowns. The um, police, the prison security come out reg regularly quite high, public transport. Again, with these data, you have to, you have to look at the actual, I haven't shown it here, the actual sizes of the number of cases, because some of these, some of these results are actually based on very small numbers. So the, the, the complexity of trying to sort out all of this is, is quite um, challenging. So now going on to um, what does the uh, uh, infection cause in terms of um, uh, health effects and I've been very simplistic here and gone from people who um, recover to uh, right through to various stages of um, severity through to um, mortality through to death. So I'm just going to show, again, there's a, quite a lot of data, but not as much as you might want from by occupation on, on some of this. So just going back and thinking about the symptoms and the outcomes from the infections, approximately a third don't develop any symptoms. They test positive, but they, it's a very mild disease. Um, some get what is termed a mild illness and, it, and it's not very nice. You can see that they can get lots and lots of symptoms, but do recover within a few weeks. Published reports seem to indicate that between about 10 and 20% of COVID patients have some kind of longer term symptoms, lingering symptoms for several weeks or even months after the infection acute, uh, up to SARS-CoV-2. I'm going to talk a little bit about this in, in a few minutes. Acute complications can occur very quickly. Something like um, fibrosis, for example, can occur within a couple of weeks. Um, and many of these people with acute complications will be those that ended up in hospital and those who ended up in intensive care units. And ending up in an intensive care unit is not a good thing from anything, never mind COVID. And then we get these long term complications, which is a debilitating illness um, and prolonged the, the symptoms, the, again, a huge number of symptoms. Um, continue for, for, for several weeks. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning that there are a lot of risk factors that make people more susceptible to these symptoms and, and these um, effects of, co of COVID. Being male and being older. And actually, if you, if you, the sort of thing people like me do when you're teaching students um, epidemiology and things is to show them the graphs of deaths. Um, oh, sorry, I've gone forward a bit. Um, by age, and uh, obviously they go up by age, and the death rates for males are about 50% higher at, at all ages, um, including at birth. For COVID, it get this, you get exactly the same curve, it goes up by age, so we shouldn't be surprised that the elderly die more. I mean, that's that's just how things are. But for some reason, men have about a 70% additional risk over the age of, of 40. And I, I don't think it's there's quite understood exactly why that happens. Comorbidities I've touch, touched on um, being, and I'll show you a, a nice graph in a minute that demonstrates this for one of the studies you know, being overweight, having heart, heart cardiovascular disease, hypertension, being a diabetic, um, being compromised uh, from the respiratory point of view. There's also quite a large group of people who may be immunosuppressed for various reasons, um, for example, previous illnesses or treatment. We know that co-exposures are not good for you generally, but I mean, smoking, um, being exposed to tobacco smoke, living in a high air pollutant environment. 
and limited access to uh, food and physical activity. And there are quite a number of socioeconomic um, factors that compound both the vulner vulnerability to um, uh, severer disease and, and susceptibility. So in the home environment, living in uh, overcrowded homes, sharing kitchens and bathrooms, um, living in a densely populated neighborhood, uh, depending on crowded transportations, but also predisposition to poorer health outcomes, um, language barriers, low socioeconomic status, so the poorer you are, and limited access to paid sick leave and health care. And I wanted to show you this graph to set that in context. This is the key worker data from ONS, and this is published in the same report as ONS. Um, the, this is the, so this is our key worker, um, key worker are in industries. And um, there's quite a spread of deciles of pay across health and social care, because there are quite a lot of well-paid doctors and other health professionals. But actually, if you look at these, about 50% of people in health and social care are in the lower four deciles of pay. And this is the same, the same it's particularly for the food and the goods area, and to some extent for education and childcare. So these are the sort of people who don't have an option but to work and so there's their socioeconomic status and the deprivation statuses and so on um, influence where both where they work what jobs they can get but also um how how they um whether they have to keep working and what they what they do to protect themselves and um this is a this is a i just want to emphasize this um, the, the inequalities in health outcomes from infections are not new. There was, uh, uh, if we go right back to the 1918 Spanish flu pan pandemic, there were huge differences in the prevalence and mortality rates between high and low income countries, the more or less affluent neighborhoods, higher and lower socioeconomic groups and between urban and rural areas. So it shouldn't surprise us that we're getting the same with the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is the Open Safely study, which is another nice study where they're linking um, primary care records um, to COVID deaths. And like we expect, we expect the um, hazard, hazard ratios to be higher for men and for um, the older people. But just looking at this, this is the index of multiple deprivation. The most deprived, um, uh, the, the more deprived the area that the people lived in, the, the higher the odds ratio um, from dying. Um, this one, this column is uh, uh, adjusted for age um, and the, the rest are, um, adjusted for uh, comorbidities and so on. The other issue that's been very prominent in, in um, reports and in press is this inequality in terms of ethnicity. And we see this here as well, that um, there's the risks compared with white ethnicity for non-white ethnicity are much, much higher. So it's very challenging to disentangle the effect of these interrelated factors. And this is, but this, in, this is one of the real problems with this particular um, data uh, and that we're having to deal with. Uh, not only are so many of the key workers in lower pay deciles, but they're also disproportionate um, uh, representing of non-white ethnic groups in some of these lower paid groups, such as the service state section, food, cleaning, delivery service, and designated as key workers. So it's all interrelated, which is a real challenge um, for researchers. 
So going on to um, deaths, these are data from the ONS, an ONS report. I've, I've just shown the open safely, but this is another set of data. This is the deaths from death certificates of people aged between 20 to 64. These, these are men. And um, these are by, ranked by the relative risk um, uh, and significantly, um, significantly um, in excess. And you can see that um, like some of the infection data I've shown, we're picking up the same uh, groups of, of workers that are, are key workers and um, potentially exposed. So we've got quite a number of health uh, in the health and social care. We've got retail, we've got um, uh, transport and so on. And these are compared with the death rate per 100,000 from the overall um, death rate, not including COVID-19, which was for the men 31.4 per 100,000. Um, these are only age adjusted. Whereas uh, the, the, the Open Safely one showed both and ONS data, they weren't able to, 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 to um, adjust for any other factors. Uh, this is just another one showing um, uh, the, the uh, relative risk slightly smaller, but with large numbers. And this is the other way around. So again, all of these are, are not unexpected looking at um, some of the riddle data and looking at the infection data. This is for the women. Um, the uh, rate um, of the percentage of, of death certificates of women aged between 20 and 64, where there was a usable occupation, uh, I should have said with the previous one, this is which was using the occupation as recorded on the death certificate, was only 60, 61.5% of those with uh, COVID as a death. Um, so much smaller numbers. So we don't get anything like the same. We do get the same picture, but not exactly the same because the numbers are just not high enough. But we get care workers, um, we get social workers, um, uh, retail, um, national government administration occupations come out. But also with smaller numbers, we get sewing machinists and hairdressers and chefs and so on. So we're getting a similar kind of picture. And the third um, study with deaths that I wanted to mention was one um, published by Nafilian et al. And this is again using death certificates as um, the source of, of the information for identifying that a death had occurred, but um, was linked back to the census data of 2011 and uses the, um, the census occupation um, instead of the occupation on the death certificate. All of these death data have problems. I mean, a death certificate is, is the occupation, the reporting of, of the death is done by somebody who's bereaved and somebody who, um, you know, on top of everything has to go and register this death and then somebody asks them what was the deceased's occupation. So that we all know about problems with the accuracy of death certificate data. The authors of this, this study also discussed the problem of um, accuracy on the, on, uh, with the census and the fact that it was 2011. So they've all got problems with uh, the data, but nevertheless are very useful studies. Um, because it was individual um, level data, they were able to um, also link it through the NHS number to hospital episode statistics and general practice data. So a very nice linkage. Um, the Scandinavians have been able to do this linkage through their, their one number that everybody has for years and years. And so it's really nice to see this sort of study coming through um, for, for Britain, for the UK. So again, not surprisingly, we get these the usual type of um, uh, care workers, uh, taxi drivers, personal services, food preparation, 
and so on, and drivers all coming out as being in, in excess. But interestingly, in this study, this is again adjusted for age. Um, if they adjust for everything, and they have a lot of data on this, this study, it, for individuals, they've got absolutely loads. If they adjust for all of these other um, factors, the um, risk estimates for these go, go right down. And you might question whether, in fact, that, that is a sensible thing to do, but it's very informative to see what happens um, in order to work out the influence of these various different even various different factors. And the third one I'm just going to mention is uh, UK Biobank. Sorry, it might be the fourth now, I've lost track, sorry. Um, this is UK Biobank, which is a cohort set up in about 2008 with lots of data and measurements actually taken on the individuals. And it's proving to be at baseline. Um, and it's proving to be an extremely useful um, uh, study. This um, study is uh, by um, Elliot and co um, and, and, work, and uh, associates. Um, and I wanted to show you, they, they actually only look at healthcare workers in, and, and the unemployed and retired, um, but it, it does demonstrate very clearly the, um, the increased risk for some of these um, uh, demographics and so on um, variables. So here's age, here are men, here is non-white ethnicity, um, here is uh, low income. This is our healthcare workers. Uh, that's the unemployed and that's the um, retired. Here we have weight, the overweight and the obese. Not much effect on cholesterol and so on. Keep, keep taking the statins, everyone. Don't ignore, don't take any notice of this. Um, isn't everybody over the age of 50 on a statin? Uh, I know they are in, the, in America. Um, and these are some of the, um, the, uh, the disease outcomes so showing higher risks here. Again, though, when they have um, the, this, this is actually the univariate. So each variable at a time data showing that the healthcare workers have a, 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 a risk of 1.66. And not surprisingly, the retired because they're all older ages have the highest risk but when adjusting for the rest of these variables education accommodation household income and so on these re reduce um, and the order is the healthcare workers followed by the unemployed and the retired and doesn't much change in this one when they're fully um, fully uh, adjusted uh, interestingly Biobank data is also very useful. Um, uh, it, that was linked um, to um, other data, um, hospital data uh, in terms of severe disease. And again, brings out all of these um, risks, these industry sectors um, and occupations, which we are the same sort of thing. So we're getting quite a lot of consistency here, which is, is helpful. Now, I wanted to talk now more about the acute effects and the complications and so on, and then the longer term effects. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time from, from COVID. Um, we've got the mild disease and the biobank data was on severe disease. Um, so you might say anybody who ends up in hospitals, you know, got some form of acute disease or is going to go on to have some form of longer term disease. But all of those vague symptoms, which we looked at to start with, also occur, a lot of them, in terms of actual what we might call co um, concrete complications, where, for example, respiratory, one, one a patient might get five lung fibrosis or persistent inflammation. So end up with um, uh, lungs that are, are compromised. They may have an embolism or deep vein thrombosis. They may have a stroke um, and, uh, and other things like um, other cardio, cardio, cardiology, cardiovascular problems. Um, 
There's also something called post-intensive care syndrome. And that's, uh, that's pretty well established as well from people who've been in intensive care. And we're getting quite good data now on patients, not with occupation, occupation's not mentioned at all, but patient data is beginning to um, uh, show us that these are clear complications where a patient may end up being actually compromised um, for, for the rest of their lives. They've got um, permanent heart problems, permanent um, respiratory problems. What's been concerning an awful lot of people, though, is what is colloquially called long COVID, but may end up being a syndrome on its own, post-COVID-19 syndrome, where we've got these huge, this, this, this is just a few of the um, reported symptoms. And, and I understand from, from respiratory colleagues and colleagues who run long COVID clinics, that they can, they can, there are a huge number of um, symptoms and problems that patients um, rec uh, report. Actually, these, this sort of, um, these sort of symptoms are also typical of other um, no, well-known syndromes, which are accepted as syndromes, not as separate diseases here, such as um, CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, and, and ME, myelagic encephalomyelitis, um, which are accepted as, as, as syndromes and treated as syndromes rather than separate. So how many people, what do we know about people having these symptoms? Well, there've been various studies, but it does partly depend on how you ask the question. I have to say that up to now, there really is not a lot of data, a very long term. Um, we're not far enough into the pandemic and after the pandemic for getting really good follow up data. But um, I know there are lots of studies going on and, and that's what we're going to get um, coming at us fairly soon. So this is an ONS date, uh, report. The ONS have got some really useful reports. And this, they, they, this is actually a deliberate thing on their part. They actually ask the question in different ways. They ask, have you had any of these 12 symptoms? So some of the symptoms I've just shown, um, 12 to 16 weeks after the infection and separated them into people that was a lab confirmed COVID-19 test, positive test, and without one. So we get two different ones here. The prevalence of any of these 12 symptoms continuously and again, we get very different diseases, uh, sorry, percentages. And then uh, by severity, we get different um, uh, percentages as well. And it also depends on how you do your survey. Well, that applies to any survey carried out. The TUC wanted to know about occupational and asked people, but a awful lot of them um, were, it was promoted through social media, through unions, through long COVID support, groups so not surprisingly most of them self-reported having this um, and and um, but it gives you an idea of how serious that um, it, the, the 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 a lot of people feel they are suffering for a long time and that's an important um, message so Marty introduced this as uh, saying well is COVID an occupational disease and I thought it was quite important to ask, well, what is an occupational disease? It's, I think we would probably um, uh, agree and any illness associated with a particular occupation um, or industry essentially being preventable. I think that's the point. And it can arise from various other um, various factors, biological, chemical and so on. In, in this case, a virus present in the work environment or encountered in the course of employment. But it is important to note that occupational disease doesn't necessarily mean worker compensation. And a lot of people will take uh, the definition of occupational disease as meaning that it is compensatable. Um, actually, different countries uh, compensate lots of different occupational diseases. Some miss them out like muscul some of the musculoskeletal um, diseases, mental health is not accepted everywhere. And they there's a huge number of um, 
a variation between what that is accepted as an occupational disease and what is accepted for compensation. They're often insurance based, they're often the burden of proof is on the individual. In, for example, they might have to actually pro prove that they have been in contact with a work, a fellow worker who has been, had a disease or a, a particular problem. I don't want to talk a lot about what we do in the UK, but setting it in context with what I've just said, the, the main one generally, and I know that there were special, um, a special uh, deaf um, compensation for health care and social care workers from COVID. Um, the, the, the one that is generally used is part of our social security system, our welfare system the Industrial Injuries Disabled Benefit, IIDB, and it's non-contributory, no-fault benefit for disablement, either for an accident or for, we've got over 70, what's known as prescribed diseases, known to be at risk from certain jobs. It is limited in that it only covers employed earners, so they have to be employed under a contract service or an office holder of some kind. Um, that's to do with the insurance system, the national insurance system. The self-employed have a different system from the employed earners. The, one of the main key features, though, of IADB is this benefit of presumption. It allows a decision maker who gets a claimant to presume the link between the disease and the occupation. The claimant has to produce evidence that they were in that particular occupation or doing that particular car task. And there has to be a medical assessment to, or, or other evidence to show that they have this particular disease, but the link between them isn't up to the, the worker that that's taken as a given if, it, if it's part of this system. And I chair this, this council, uh, which has been going since 1948. <laughs> so it's very well established. Um, and it's, uh, if we provide advice, and I think the word is advice, it's not necessarily accepted, but our advice goes to the Secretary of State for Work and Pension and the Minister for Disabled People who works with them. So uh, it works best for disease, diseases where you can actually measure something, you know, uh, an FEV or something like that. It, it really needs to be a disease that has some loss of fun function and causes a disability. That's what it's designed for. And obviously new onset disease due to the occupation. So if we were going to do anything for COVID, we need to think about when would, when would this infection have to have taken place? So is it the whole of the pandemic? Is it the first wave? Is it the second wave and so on? How are we actually going to get proof of the infection? Are we going to accept di doctor diagnosed? Does it have to have a PCR? Uh, what's the disease and when does it occur? How are we going to diagnose it and how are we going to evaluate the disability? If you think about the occupations I've shown you, the, um, or we've discussed today, there's, there's certainly some evidence of increased risks um, in, in uh, quite a lot of um, sectors, including health and, and, and social care. So in summary, I think I've shown a, a lot of evidence that workers in many occupations are at greater risk both of being infected, developing COVID with increased risk of severe disease and, and dying. And there's good evidence from patient data of serious complications that can occur from having COVID. And that may lead to long-term loss of function and potential disability. However, the big gap at the moment is this post-COVID-19 syndrome, long COVID. It's accumulating, but there are currently few studies of long-term effects and disability and almost nothing relating directly to occupation. So what we urgently need is some data on occupation, especially to be routinely collected and reported in health and social data and good quality studies of occupying COVID in occupational studies assessing. So should it be in the fast lane? And if so, which fast lane? And this is my last slide. Um, the answer I think is yes. But which lane should it be in? This is um, a, a, 
a study that has literally just been published, um, put on um, the preprint website in uh, November, and it's on vaccinations. It comes from Nafala and, 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 and colleagues again. Um, um, Marty is one of the all, um, and, and the HSC and all sorts of people have been working on this. It's a really informative study in terms of informing risk reduction. This is the vaccination rates and odds ratios for not being fully vaccinated by various occupations. And this is the top, their top 20. And lo and behold, all of these occupations that we've just been talking about come in here, that they are, they are, have low vaccination rates. So where's the fast lane from now on? Well, it, the immediate issue is not any other thing other than vaccination. We know about prevention in terms of ventilation, wearing masks, not hugging your fellow workers, etc. But the easiest thing would be to get vaccinations into these people. And so I, I think it's a challenge for the occupational community to working with the vaccination community, the health service, Public Health England, and whoever else can help to uh, try and improve immediately the access and availability of vaccines and getting to these what are admittedly hard to reach people. So I'm going to stop there and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you very, very much for that uh, that that excellent kind of uh, lecture. Um, there are uh, opportunities. We have an opportunity now to uh, to ask uh, some questions. Um, I have. I know that there were, that there's been a question in the chat and also I think on the YouTube one. Um, I'm I'm going to the one uh, first on the on I think there was a question that was posted on uh, the YouTube channel, um, and this is about return to work. And and lastly, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to answer this, but I'll I, I think I'll I'll just answer the question anyway. The question and, and I don't know who the question comes from. Apologies. Um, so in my service, we've had lots of failed returns to work, as the current phased return process doesn't seem to fit for people with long COVID. Um, I wondered if you've got any suggestions about what might be useful in supporting people back to work. Um, uh, yes, this isn't my area of expertise. Um, and I think it, it's a very important question, though, and it goes with the sort of controversial issue about making people have vaccines um, and also um, allowing people, as, as the question says, to, to go back gradually. I think there are companies, there are um, organisations, there are industries that have the facilities to do that. However, um, the people that I've just been looking at that's showing you that are at greatest risk of getting infected, getting, um, getting the COVID to start with, um, are the people that are going to find it impossible to have a phased return to work. So uh, not only do we need to encourage workplaces that can, can allow phased working, and I, I know a few people who are doing this, but um, we need to think about these people who, are, for example, if you're on a night shift and you go home, you get the kids up and give them breakfast, take them to school, you have a few hours sleep, you know, um, then you've got to start all over again. Uh, phasing for some of these workplaces and the jobs are just is just not possible. You can't phase in a delivery driver because they can't live. They're not getting enough money. So I think it's a really important, um, uh, important question. How do we do this? And what do we do about people who are insecure, in, yeah, insecure jobs and jobs where it's not easy to do? Leslie, um, can I ask Kurt, Kurt Strife to uh, unmute and ask, uh, well, in fact, I think you had two questions. Um, Kurt, if you're online and you can find your unmute button, 
It uh, now worked. It didn't work before. Thank you, uh, Leslie, for an excellent overview up to date till what has okay. been published today and uh, Marty for organizing that and moderating. I, I have two questions. They are related to the issue of uh, prescribed occupational disease. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll start with the second one. Um, so what is typically insured and covered is the occupational risk. And in that case, it would be the transmission. And uh, But risk factors are different for transmission and the severity of disease, as you also nicely pointed out. And then it's typically the clinical disease, uh, the kind of uh, whatever uh, health effects and long-term impact, including long COVID, that would be covered. And also workers are insured as they are. So a kind of, if they have a comorbidity or diabetes, which has an impact on severity. So this is a, a big complexity for the compensation of uh, COVID-19 as an occupational disease. How is this being discussed in the UK? And I'll persuade with my second question. Until okay. We are. Well, the UK system is not insurance-based. It's, it's an integral part of our social security system. So when a, a disease is prescribed, um, uh, the, 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 it's, it's, it's actually has to go through secondary legislation. The legislation is changed. And um, it, the de de the, how it's prescribed means that we have to very clearly uh, define the occupations and the occupations per se that have got the increased risk and the um, clinical manifestations that the disease that we're, we're um, uh, concerned with. Um, they're, they're usually, um, in terms of the actual um, assessment, they, there wouldn't be, um, because it's, it's <laughs> it, the, we have this with many of the prescribed, most of the prescribed diseases, not all of them, this benefit of presumption, the link between the occupational risk and the disease is made for them and in legislation. The, the, um, the worker themselves, the claimant does not have to provide proof of the exposure at all. It's a given. So um, I, it is, it's very different from the insurance space. I was looking at some of the, the data on other um, countries and, and a worker, as I said, some, I think it's Finland, they would have actually to, to say, yes, I, I worked with, you know, somebody and I, he was tested positive and I got it and now I've got this nasty disease. Um, it's not, it's a completely different system in this. And so, so once it's prescribed, um, it's, it's a no fault, there's no fault um, a, a compensation system. So the individual, um, it doesn't have to prove, if you like, that bit. It's not like a court of law. No, uh, I, I hope that sorry, perhaps, if I may follow up, Marty, just oh, from... can, can I can I because there's a couple of questions that are okay. related Perfect. to this. So sorry. Can I, can I just can I, so um, there's a there's a couple of questions on the YouTube, and I'll come back to you, Kurt. Sorry. Um, so uh, there is a question uh, on uh, one that kind of assumes. Um, uh, Sorry. Um, one question is: Have uh, has the have you kind of considered other infectious diseases in this way, or is is COVID unique as an infectious disease, as uh, in in uh, in the kind of injury, uh, the industrial injury class? No. There are um, there are quite a number of um, uh, diseases under the sort of biological ones. I mean, some of them are zo zoonoses, you know, like Q fever and things like that. But there are some viruses as well. So the um, hepatitis virus, for example, for um, uh, healthcare workers. So we do we do um, have some of these. Having said that, um, the council have not looked at the infections since two thousand and three. So it's on our work program list to do an update. So, for example, uh, they looked looked at HIV twenty years ago and um, in, in healthcare workers, and that hasn't been looked at again with the more up-to-date data. So yes, we have got quite a few um, uh, infectious, including some viruses. And then one, one more question before I come back to you, Kurt. Um, 
There's a question about uh, the criterion for declaring, declaring an, a new disease to be work-related is that the incidence should be at least twice the general incidence in the population. And the question is, do you still do you support this criterion? Um, well, um, it's actually in legislation, it doesn't say double the risk, it says more likely than not. Mm -hmm. So if you've got good epidemiological data, that shows double the risk, then your job's done for you because it's more likely than not. The problem is increasingly arising because um, I'm sure many of you realize this, that actually um, occupation's not popular in terms of refer research funding. So we have fewer and fewer um, uh, occupational studies these days. And so we have to consider, if you like, uh, looking at the totality of other evidence with what epidemiology we can find. So we would look at the exposure pathways, we would look at, um, uh, you know, uh, incidents and so on, and, and, um, and the mechanisms, um, uh, is, is it reasonable thing to think about? Like, like, many, like many risk assessment type committees, um, in order to, to um, say, well, is it more likely than not that this, this is, is um, associated um, with the, this particular occupation? Um, so it is, it is easier if you've got good epidemiology, um, but, but it's not you don't entirely have to do that because of course we, get, we do get diseases where, um, you know, like coal workers and pneumoconiosis has to be coal workers. And we get somewhere there, are, um, it, it, it's pretty well a, a given that if they get that exposure, it's in the occupation. But with this particular one and with others, um, we have to just look at what evidence we've got, the strength, the consistency, and so on, in making a, a judgment. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. Um, good. I might come back to you later on. There's a few other questions appearing now, and, and I'd like to give other people the opportunity too. So, um, if that's okay. Um, so, uh, Richard, Richard Heron, are you on the call? And do you want to ask your question to Leslie directly? Thanks, Marty. And thanks very much, Leslie. It's fantastic. I think you've probably already answered it. There's different degrees of proof for different reasons. But I was wondering, when you mentioned uh, what constitutes an occupational disease, it was all about association, and there was no mention of exposure. But I'm presuming that you pre-require exposure to sort of Bradford Hill is in the background of the, de of the definition. Um, yes, I, Brad, I, I think it's really useful to go back and look at Bradford Hill's paper because he, he specifically says it shouldn't be used as a tick list. But, but having said that, the criteria that he came up with, um, the consistency, the quality, et cetera, is extremely useful to follow. Um, and yes, of course, exposure is, you know, the, the, what I didn't mention, um, perhaps uh, should have done, but for example, um, an awful lot of work went into uh, developing uh, job exposure matrices for COVID and giving the sort of probabilities in terms of um, uh, what, what the risk was likely to be. Um, where the risks were. Now, this was is, is useful not just for people like myself doing studies where I haven't got any exposure data, but also for risk reduction, identifying risk reduction measures. So, so yes, exposure is a key key element of, of the of the evidence that we look at. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, and I can I come next to uh, Neil Neil Bourne, please. Hi, Leslie. Good to see you. Hi, Neil. Good to see you too. Thanks so much for the great talk. Um, always incisive as usual. Um, as a, as a, a non-epidemiologist, as you know, I just wondered if uh, what you thought, if vaccination is the gold standard for preventing this disease, how do you rate the use and policing of better masks in the workplace? That's an interesting one. I don't think I actually use the word um, uh, the gold standard, but um, it does seem to be very effective. And we've now got this, uh, this, this study that has just come out um, from Marty's group and, and the School of Hygiene and, and HSE. Um, 
is really, really, I think, important. And I do hope that the powers that be are having a look at that because it, it's, um, we are, of course, hope in a panic now, aren't we? The whole world is with a new variant um, and, and this rush to get everybody vaccinated. But I have a, a fear that these workers are going to actually be left, be left behind again, not because they're feckless and, and or anti-vaxxers necessarily. Some of them will not be bothered or whatever. But I think many of them, it's lack of access. You know, if we had um, somebody running around and doing them, getting them as they came off shift, um, uh, uh, I, I don't know about policing masks. I think the, the issue there, and I'm sure my occupational hygiene colleagues would say so, is what type of mask. Mm. So if you're going to wear a mask, then you need one that's good enough for occupational work and dusts and things um, in order to in order to be preventive. So. But policing, I, I can't really comment on that. I don't know whether work, workplaces are making, making people wear masks. There's enough issue about making vaccination compulsory in healthcare settings, and that's a, that's a, a moral issue. So it's an interesting question, but I can't answer it directly. <laughs> Now, well, that's really interesting. Thank you. And, and do have a good Christmas if we're not in touch before. OK, thank you. And to you and everybody. So there was another a, a previous question, actually, that I overlooked in terms of vaccination. And, the, and the, there was a question. And again, I'm not entirely sure whether this is whether you'll be able to answer this. But the question was regarding vaccinations. How confident are you in the data that vaccination reduces long COVID? I don't think I can answer that with long COVID. I think the issue with long COVID is we haven't even defined it. The term wasn't defined until December or so last year. And we're still exploring um, what exactly it is and what are the serious health effects and how to treat it. So I think, um, you know, never mind the occupational link with long COVID, generally, it's a huge issue for for the health service and for 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 health care um, generally and um, you it's an interesting question because you might think that long covid it might just be for people who had severe, severe disease but we certainly there are certainly reports and and uh, of people with mild disease who never get into hospital for example having very long term effects so, so I can't answer it in terms of vaccination, but I do know that the, the severity of your COVID disease, the disease you get, doesn't necessarily um, tell you that you, you're going to be more or less at risk of getting this, this, what I think will end up as a syndrome of its own, or may well do. I would have to leave that to my clinical co colleagues to, to comment. Uh, thanks, Leslie. I'll come back to Kurt if he's still if he's still on the line for a second question. Kurt, I'm still on the line. Thanks, Marty, and I'm most happy if you take the others first. Um, as you know, typically I strongly focus on primary prevention, but here my focus is more on tertiary prevention, at least for the moment. So the the more likely than not is in essence what leads to this kind of a triple fraction of fifty percent, and that leads then to the relative risk of two or more which is somewhat methodologically flawed, but is also used in the German system to some extent. And so the question for me specifically, and that is a refinement of my earlier question, would you want to see a relative risk of two for the transmission, which is the occupational risk, or for COVID-19 as a disease or for COVID-related death? Because we know that the risk factors are very different in terms of comorbidities, et cetera. I would think that it is about the transmission uh, where we want to see a relative risk of two. And uh, also molding in my, my second question, uh, I would also see that if a worker has to rely on public transport and commutes with public transport, that this part should also be insured. And so they, if they are at increased risk by commuting, that should also be seen as an occupational accident. At least in principle, it could be covered. 
Yeah, that's an interesting issue. And I can tell you right away that we in IAC, the Industrial Injury Advisory Council, have been specifically told that public transport, travel to work is not included for industrial injuries, disablement benefit. So for the UK, or I agree with you, these the people that went to work during the pandemic, most of them, um, you know, like if I'm in the London area, you wouldn't use um, anything other than public transport. Um, doesn't it doesn't count so so that I think will be very much depending on the country as far as double the risk for um the exposure um I don't think there are many studies that give you that by occupation um a quantitatively we we know which um which occupations tasks etc are more likely to give you uh, or potentially could it expose you to a higher um, exposure, you know, to, you might get a higher exposure in than others. Um, but again, you know, the comorbidities and so on, the exposure is going to depend, depend on the risk reduction strategies in the workplace. So, um, you know, if you're, we've had huge numbers of outbreaks in crowded offices and in say food processing, meat processing, um, where people are very close together with that, so therefore a higher higher risk. But as, as for quantitatively um, estimating the risk due to proximity, due to lack of ventilation, due to lack of PPE, I, I'm afraid I don't know whether there've been any good studies done on that. Um, I don't know whether there's anybody on the call who's an expert in the occupational hygiene um, where, where that's been done. But um, the, yeah. the, the compensation systems and um, what, what we traditionally do is, is, as you say, we look for the risk um, in terms of the disease, the outcome rather than the cause. Um, but it you know, it, 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 from from a, our point, of, from I think everybody's point of view, what you're trying to do is form a picture of consistency. And I think what I've tried to do in my talk is to look at data which allows us to see that the same groups of occupations come up time and time again. I didn't show you the gems, the job, job exposure metrics, but it comes up in those, comes up in the infections, it comes up in the deaths, it comes up in... The, um, you know, in other other data as well. So um, I'm not absolutely sure that, that looking at just occupational exposure is, is the way forward. That, that I think we need the disease as well. Okay, um, there's one question. I'll, I'll take two more questions if that's okay uh, with, with you, Leslie. The first yeah, sure. one, uh, is, is coming from the, 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 the live stream and it's from Peter Buckle. Um, and the question, his question is, are long COVID patients more likely to become reinfected? Um, I have no idea. I can't answer that, Peter. Good. Thank you for the question. <laughs> um, I, 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 I actually would question whether a definition of a long COVID patient has been agreed internationally. Um, we've got, uh, you know, the, the WHO came out with a different definition in, in October. So I would say in the next six months, we're going to see the definition of um, uh, long, long COVID, post COVID, this syndrome tightened up more with a lot more, um, lot more specific as to what the key uh, health issues are within it. Um, but I, I'm afraid I have no idea about the um, reinfection of people who've got this. I, I, I'm assuming you're thinking about um, susceptibility, um, weakened um, immune systems and so on. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't have any data on that. And then I think uh, the last question, uh, I think Aparna, if you're on the line, if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you for a fabulous talk. Really enjoyed it. And um, I think um, as a 
public health person, obviously I'm coming at it from the inequalities work that you presented mm -hmm. and uh, taking on board the caveats that you said with those data. Um, it's thinking about the fact that we're going to be living with long COVID in our most vulnerable where work affects the illness and illness affects work and how we um, and from your point of view um, support build capacity within employers and other key um, teams so that we can basically try to reduce some of the outcomes um, that are less favorable um, in our most vulnerable communities and, and your thoughts on now that we've measured it, now that we've seen it, what, what would you advise uh, that we do to intervene to reduce inequalities? Thank you. That's a really interesting question. Um, one that's almost impossible to answer. Um, I know from colleagues that an awful lot of work is going on on rehabilitation uh, measures to help people um, and within hospitals and long COVID um, clinics and so on to, to get people not only feeling well, but coping. Um, and, and I would leave it to them to do, but it depends um, really on where you work. And we have a very unequal society in terms of work, um, not just in terms of income. And to be honest with you, uh, the reason I put occupation, um, it, it, you know, in that diagram was that what you do influences the rest of your life um, because it gives you an income, a certain income, which allows you to um, decide how to spend it in terms of your diet, in terms of your health, um, uh, in terms of your housing and so on. And we have a, a lot of people who have are very poor and very un, unwell and and they and they I haven't started but I haven't <laughs> mentioned this at all but but obviously you're in an occupation because of what went before when you were a child and your parents and so on and where you lived and how you were brought up um, and so there there are a lot of vulnerable people I think it gets left to the social care people, the health care, health service to cope with the, the, the more vulnerable people. And I think um, I don't want to get into politics, but there are a lot of people who for whom they, they miss out on these things. Having said that, I have huge res respect for all the people that work in these. Our health service is absolutely wonderful, um, you know, in capturing these people. Um, so uh, it's a much, I'm not really answering your question, but I'm, I'm thinking it, there are, it's not just long COVID and COVID related diseases, it's a lot of ch chronic disease is rife in, in, our, in our society and, um, and a lot of people never get a chance to do anything about it. So, you know, the occupational people, the occupational health researchers, workers, um, I think can, can do a lot. I think one of the, there have been, I'm sorry, I'm waffling, but there, 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 there have been positive things of this pandemic. And one of the positive things is that groups have got together and started to work more together. And that includes the occupational health community. They are working with the public health. They are working with hospitals. They're, they're, they're working with industry and, and, um, and worker organisations. So I think I would want to encourage that. And I mean, the vaccination issue is, an, um, is a good one to start. How do we really get to these people, the people that never read the HSE wonderful guidelines on everything on their website, but never bother about it. The people that have never heard of silica and yet are cutting up um, floor tiles in an enclosed space, that sort of thing. It's the same with the vaccination problem and, and COVID. How do we get to those people? So I just encourage all the organizations to, to increase the work they do together. It's joined up thinking really, whether that's 
it's, it's very easy for somebody to say, but uh, not difficult to do. So thank you for the question. Inequalities is a lot to do with, with the results I've just shown. Okay, so I think I think that's uh, we, where where we are. Really, it's half past five, uh, and and I I think we need to bring it to a close. So, thank you ever so much, Leslie, uh, for for your fascinating and fantastic talk. Um, also, like to thank all the people who've been on the the Zoom uh, link asking questions, but also on the on the on the live uh, YouTube. Um, uh, channel and uh, Kurt, thank you very much. I was going to suggest that we give a round of applause to uh, to uh, to Leslie. We can't do it in, in in you know in person, but we can do it with these kind of uh, signs that, that that Zoom gives us. Um, really interesting insight, um, and on on the kind of link between work and and COVID and and vice versa, and also what's needed to kind of you know what needed in the UK to kind of how 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 we kind of establish whether something is a, a work-related disease or should be compensatable. And I very much support your, uh, your, your kind of, um, your uh, notion, your statement that uh, we really kind of uh, need, and it would be very good if we could uh, encourage various organizations to try to include kind of occupation as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a piece of information that's collected kind of in, in routine data. And I think, I think there's some positive signs that going forward that this is now kind of acknowledged by uh, by by many other people now as an important kind of uh, a factor to to be recorded. So hopefully, uh, in future, we'll be able to do these kind of studies uh, a, a lot easier. And and I'm very much looking forward to uh, to uh, to the uh, to the next uh, well to to the uh, census data of uh, of 2021 becoming. Yes. Because that uh, a lot of people will be kind of uh, making use of that as well. So that's I think that's where I'll, I'd like to end. So again, Leslie, thank you very very much. It was a fantastic talk, and I'll, again also thank you everyone for your contributions. So with that, I wish you uh, uh, all the best. Have a good evening. Unfortunately, we can't offer you a drink and a virtual drink, but uh, but hopefully next year we'll be able to do uh, the next uh, uh, Lane lecture in person. So. It, with that, uh, I wish you all uh, a very good evening and uh, if, when it comes, a very nice Christmas and New Year. Thank you, Martin. Thank you.